can we start the moto yes sure 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 यशस्सुक्तेषु जाग्रति यशस्सुक्तेषु जाग्रति कामं 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 शो उशो निर्मिमाणः निर्मिमाणः तदेव शुक्रम् तदेव शुक्रदब्रह्मा कौन करेंगे प्रदेश से माइक कौन करेंगे ओके ओके शॉप ओके गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन आई थिंक इट्स एन अमेजिंग टाइम टू गैदर ऑल ऑफ़ अस फॉर दिस वांडरफुल सेशन एंड आई थिंक वेरी मच नीड ऑफ़ द आर to just to quickly introduce myself, I am Rudhiyesh Pankhania, the Regional Council Member and very glad to address this session. I think as all of you are aware that our this terms, this year's theme is lead, you know, as we say lead towards excellence, achievement and development. As you all are aware that we all need to excel in the field that we've been working. The moment we start excelling that development is but naturally a byproduct so i think that's certainly the theme and you know that is what our chairman sir mr murtuza kachwala sir has been setting an example on uh, so that is something we've been looking as we all of them are aware there are a lot of amendments to the schedule 3 and i think this session was very much needed and uh, not better than anybody else. I think we've got an excellent faculty for the day, CA Praveen Setia, sir. And thank you so much for accepting this and being a part uh, as a faculty, sir. So thank you so much for being there. I would like to thank Palaksha and Sharon Sangvi as well to help us, you know, to be a coordinator for this entire event and making sure that this entire event is going to be a success. So I think without taking much time, you know, let's jump to quickly our uh, today's session that we've gathered on. I think very much need of the hour and I'm sure all our members are going to get too much amazing benefited from this session uh, and practically applying to this. I request uh, Palakshar, CA, our coordinator to kindly introduce our faculty for the day. Thank you, Ritesh, for your time and addressing the session. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today who is going to talk to us about amendments to Schedule 3, Division 2 on NDS. Praveen sir is a chartered accountant and a member of the institute with, with about 15 years of professional experience, working with a large professional services firm in India. He is experienced in managing large complex audits of several large Indian listed and multinational clients in broad range of industries. Sir has contributed several articles in ICI journal and has delivered lecture at the professional forum. Thank you so much, sir, for taking your esteemed time. Without taking much of your time, the stage is on. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you, uh, Palak, Ridesh, and Sharon, and welcome uh, members uh, on the call. I hope I'm audible and my presentation is visible to everyone. Uh, your voice is audible. Yeah, is my presentation visible now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this presentation on Amendment to Schedule 3. 
an extremely relevant topic you know which is uh, which is relevant for the upcoming financial year 21 22 uh, i am praveen setia uh, so while while uh, palak has introduced professional side of my journey i would just try to take few minutes to be introduced to my personal side as well so i i live in mumbai with my family i am married and i have a son who is growing up uh, not here as the day progresses um, and uh, my family my father my parents and uh, my my wife has been a strong source, source of support and encouragement uh, throughout my professional journey so with that with that brief about myself uh, I just wanted to tell you that financially year 21 22 is very unique uh, from a perspective of financial reporting in the sense that there were several amendments or updates which are applicable for this financial year and onwards and to name a few first is uh, caro 2020 which is an enhanced reporting uh, under caro with multiple clauses which are newly introduced and this will be applicable for the first time for financial year ended 21 22 uh, there are certain enhancements to the auditor's report uh, whereby uh, we as an auditor are required to comment upon whether company has made adequate disclosures in the financial statements about amounts which are being lent to an intermediary company which in turn are being lent to the funding party uh, and you know there are several other amendments which we need to take care and lastly uh, the significant of those is uh, schedule 3 amendment and uh, that is what we are going to cover in this in this uh, session today before I proceed further, I just wanted to brief everyone that Schedule 3 amendments, there are three divisions. Uh, so Division 1 is applicable to companies which are preparing their financial statements other than India's, which is a normal accounting standard, which is under company accounting standard rules. Division 2 is applicable to companies which are required to prepare their financial statements under India's, which is Indian accounting standard. And Schedule 3 is, of course, applicable to companies which are NBFC. So these are three divisions within Schedule 3. And what we are going to cover today is a division two, which is applicable to uh, companies are required to comply with India's uh, uh, requirements. So the broadly, we will we'll break down our today's session into uh, three major components. Uh, first is I will provide you with a brief overview of uh, you know a certain background about why these changes come and what are the effective dates, etc. Uh, secondly, we will kind of deep dive into some of the major amendments which are impacting the presentation and classification of uh, the financial statement line item. Third would be what are the key amendments which are impacting disclosure requirement under Schedule 3. And there are certain amendments which are not applicable to the large space of the company, but those are certain certain specific where we'll briefly briefly touch upon those as well. Uh, so with that, I will straightly move to the uh, the first one, which is uh, which is overview. So if you can see applicability, so. Uh, MC has notified this amendment to Schedule 3, uh, you know, somewhere in March 24, 2021. And these amendments are all applicable from financial year ended 31st March 2022, which is effective from April 1, 2021. So if you are a company which is having a calendar year, year as their financial year end, like, for example, if you have an year end of December, then these amendments would be applicable to you for period beginning on or after 1st January 2022, which is for December 22 will be the first year in which these will be applicable to you for companies which are following April as a financial year uh, for them this will be applicable for 31st March 2022. What is the purpose? The purpose of this amendment is basically nothing but to provide additional disclosures to the various users of financial statements which will in a way help them to understand the operations of the company and also uh, you know to in a way uh, uh, to provide more details about uh, the business operations of the company. Third is what are some of the important considerations that we need to bear in mind uh, while 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 we apply this Schedule 3. So first and foremost is this amendment to Schedule 3 is applicable for presentation and disclosure requirements for current year, which is 31st March 2022. And we need to also update our disclosures, which for the corresponding period, which is 31st March 2021. So the financial statements would undergo a change for two periods. One is 31st March 2022, and we need to update our corresponding period figure as well for 31st March 2021. That is one. Now, when we go through some of these changes, and you'll realize that some of the disclosure requirements which are being brought about by this Schedule 3 are voluminous in nature. They require a huge amount of information to be compiled, reviewed, etc. And because of which it is highly recommended that companies update their ERP systems, processes, and controls, uh, which will help them to really gear up to prepare those financial information, additional disclosures, and also to ensure that 
the information that is being reported in the financial statements is actually complete and accurate as well third important factor is that while since most of these disclosures will be included in the financial statements the controls around preparation of these disclosures would actually be relevant controls or i would say key controls and hence those would need to be covered as a part of our reporting under internal controls internal financial controls over financial statements so we need to bear in mind that these controls will be significant and those will need to be implemented by companies for the purpose of preparation of these financial statements lastly there is a guidance note which has been issued by icci which kind of provides detailed guidance in some of these amendments what kind of judgments that you can exercise etc and then people members can go through those in detail to actually acquaint themselves to this uh, on these amendments with that let us try and understand what are the major amendments which are impacting classification so the first and foremost is the presentation of current maturities of long term borrowing so in the current schedule 3 the current maturity of long term borrowing which is nothing but the amount relating to term loans or long term borrowings which are for period more than 1 year and as for the contractual terms these amounts are payable within 12 months period which may include uh, you know amount which are payable within 12 months and hence those are classified as current maturities under the existing schedule 3 those items were required to be classified as other financial liability in the financial statements now this has undergone a change with the new amendment schedule 3 the current maturities of long term borrowing will be required to be disclosed as a part of short term borrowing so effectively what it means is a portion of the long term borrowing which was previously classified as other financial liability would now be classified as short term borrowing in the financial statement which is a which is a good good update because a user as a, of the financial statements would really know how much is the total borrowing of the company and out of which how much is something which is payable in the next one year uh, which would impact the the liquidity profile of the company as well so this is a important change uh, companies impacted by this would need to recast or regroup uh, their in financial information of current maturities of long term borrowing from other financial liability and reclassify that to short term borrowing in the financial statements both for current period as well as for the corresponding period uh, next one is uh, is about security deposit so here uh, under the existing schedule 3 security deposits were required to be disclosed as a component of loans uh, uh, loans which are being given to companies uh, uh, as a part of the loan now this has undergone a change uh, under the new schedule 3 deposits are no longer required to be disclosed under loans but these are required to be classified as other financial assets this is again a very welcome move because in most cases some of this deposit that you pay to electricity department or maybe to any other authorities uh, uh, for utility companies typically do not have the nature of loans but just because uh, it was prescribed that way people used to show it as a part of the loan but now this anomaly has been corrected and the security deposits are rightly being classified as a part of other financial asset third is lease liability so previously Uh, the, there was no prescribed uh, presentation about lease liability in the schedule 3 and the disclosure requirements were flowing more from indias 116 which kind of provides guidance about lease accounting uh, and there was a diversity of practice uh, some companies used to disclose lease liabilities on the face of the balance sheet other companies used to disclose lease liabilities as a as a part of the as a part of the financial liability right so there was a disparity in practice but this has been now Uh, done away with uh, with schedule 3 specifically mentioning uh, that lease liability will need to be classified on the face of the balance sheet after the borrowing so if it is a long term lease liability it will be part of non current uh, financial liability and if it is a, sh a short term lease uh, which is payable within 12 months time uh, this amount will be classified as current financial liability uh, under current financial liabilities on the face of the balance sheet so this is uh, again a change which will require companies if at all they have classified uh, lease liability as a part of financial liability to kind of regroup that and show it to the face of the financial statement so in substance there were three major classification changes uh, first is current maturity of long term borrowing uh, second is security deposit and third is lease liability uh, when i when uh, when i come when it comes to the first one uh, since this was very prescriptive most companies will need to change uh, this classification from other financial liability to 
short term borrowing because it was specifically mentioned in the schedule 3 item number 2 and item number 3 uh, certain companies based on the maturity and based on their own judgment were classifying these items differently either on the face of the balance sheet or as a part of other financial lab, uh, financial assets or security deposits and for those companies who have been doing such classifications since inception there will be no change but for other companies you would need to regroup both current period financial information as well as corresponding period financial information to ensure that those are in line with schedule 3. So I'll just pause for a moment here and uh, people can just read the slide for two minutes and then I'll take I'll move forward. Now after we have gone through the classification changes let us try and understand what are the disclosure changes which has been affected by schedule 3 and these are some of the voluminous information that company may need to compl uh, com uh, compile for the purpose of disclosure in the financial statements so first one is about promoter shareholding so now in earlier schedule 3 companies were required to disclose details of the shareholders who are holding more than five percent of the equity share capital uh, and those details were disclosed in the financial statements now in addition to that companies are also required to disclose what are the shares which are being held by the promoters both in current year as well as previous year and what is the change that has happened between the two periods uh, so if you can look at the table they have prescribed the format for disclosure so it needs to be including the name of the promoter the number of shares what are the percentage of the shares holding which which is with the promoters and what has changed in the current year as compared to previous year so this is a disclosure requirement which is there under the schedule 3 when it comes to promoter promoters are uh, for the purpose of this disclosure would mean promoters which are being defined under the companies act under section 269 uh, these primarily include persons who are actually mentioned as promoters in the prospectus or in companies who file their annual return under section 92 there's a specific requirement to define who are the promoters and to disclose their holding uh, uh, as a promoter while making those filings to the mca so you can refer to that as well uh, the the forms which are being filed under section 92 and also it could also include people who are having control of the board of directors in accordance with whose risk directions guidance uh, the board of directors are supposed to act etc and who can actually decide make major decisions uh, in case of the company so this is a definition of promoters and based on that definition a uh, company would need to identify the promoters of course those identifications are already being done by the company when they make a filing to under as a part of the sebi regulation as a part of section 92 of the company is that and then they can use that definition and those information and then include that as a part of the disclosure in the financial statements here what is important is um, we need to ensure a consistency between the information which is being disclosed in the financial statements vis-a-vis -vis information which is being filed uh, in the annual report annual return under section 92 and also uh, in case of listed companies the information that is being filed uh, with the stock exchanges Moving on to next one, uh, there's a small change in case of uh, statement of changes in equity. So uh, this is uh, a change in the schedule three, which requires that if there's an error uh, uh, in the prior PA, prior year, because of which the amount of equity share capital has undergone a change. Uh, so you need to disclose the impact of that change, which is arising on account of prior period error. So uh, they have prescribed a format that okay if there's an error in disclosing or in computing the amount of equity share capital then you disclose the balance at the beginning of the year what could be the change in the equity share capital due to prior period errors what is the reinstated balance and then if there are fresh issue of shares there are buyback or there are any other transactions which would result into changes in the equity share capital then those information will get disclosed in the column number four and finally you come to the last one which is the closing uh, amount uh, at the end of the current reporting period so this is nothing but this is bringing the disclosure requirement in line with the accounting standard 8 whereby if there were any prior period errors you would reinstate your financial statements to reflect the change or the, to reflect the error and then state the fact that there was an error and this is a restated balance so this is nothing but to bring in line with in this 8 uh, they have introduced this change 
I will move to next item, which is uh, capital work in progress. Now, this is one of the significant change that has been brought about by Schedule 3. And there are two major components of this disclosure around capital work in progress. One which is there on the slide, and there is one which will disclose, uh, we'll discuss in slide number 10 subsequently. Uh, this disclosure requirement is applicable for CWIP, which is capital work in progress. It is equally applicable to intangible assets under development. And also, uh, in, if you call for the company is having investment property and it is under development, then this information or this schedule is also required to be disclosed as a part of um, uh, as a part of Schedule 3. Now, what does this information or this disclosure talks about? It talks about that the company would need to provide an aging of its capital work in progress in the specified format, which is less than one year, one to two years, two to three years, and more than three years. And the total of these aging bucket would need to tie out to your CVIP schedule in the balance sheet. Okay. Uh, when you disclose this information, the information needs to be broken up into two components. One is projects which are in progress, and second is projects which are temporarily suspended. So you break your total CVIP into two baskets. One is projects in progress, second is projects temporarily suspended. And then based on the recognition of those costs as a part of the CWIP, the aging will get populated or we need to be disclosed as a part of this table. Uh, and the total should actually match with the, uh, with the CVIP schedule, which is there. Here, what is important is how do you actually build up your aging? You would build up your aging based on the initial recognition of the cost relating to CWIP. So take an example that your total CVIP as at 31st March 2022 was about 500 crores. Uh, you incurred about, let us say, 80 crores in 2018, maybe 120 crores in 2019, uh, which totals up to about 200 crores. You incur about 200 crores uh, in in uh, 2020 and somewhere in December uh, December 2021 you incurred additional uh, 100 crores so something which was incurred four years later I means in 2018 will get shown as a part of more than three years uh, something which was incurred in 2019 will be between two to three years and the amount of expenditure that was incurred in let us say in the current financial year before uh, March 31 2022 will all be classified as a part of less than one year age bucket. So this is how you would compute your aging for the purposes of disclosure in, the, uh, in this format. Now, how do you define what are projects which are temporarily suspended? Typically, you would use the guidance which is there in India's 23, which is, uh, which is nothing but borrowing cost capitalization. So it talks about a situation where if, if the delay or suspension is necessarily required to be part of the of part of the construction of an asset or to bring the asset to be ready for its intended use such time period should should not be treated as temporarily suspended and those projects will be part of the projects in progress however there are delays on account of regulatory changes on account of certain different uh, nuances because of which company has decided to suspend the project then those projects which are suspended will need to be separately called out and disclosed as a part of Schedule 3. Also, what is important is when do you call these projects as in progress or temporarily suspended, right? So you need to look at the status of this project as at the balance sheet date. So to give an example, suppose a project was suspended throughout the year, let us say till 1st of March 2022, and subsequently the project started. Uh, you know, the activity commences on that project and as at 31st March 2022, the project is active. In such situation, while the project has been suspended throughout the period, but if as at 31st March 2022, the activities are in progress, the, the those amounts will be classified as projects in progress. Put, and to put it differently, let us say a project was in progress till 31st March 2022, but let us say one month down the line, company decided not to pursue this project and the project is suspended in that situation as at 31st March 2022 since the project was in progress the entire disclosure will be driven based on the status of the project as a 31st March 2022 and hence it will be part of the first bracket as project in progress 
uh, again, as I said, this is a very voluminous information. A uh, company would really need to see how much information they can gather from their ERP system, whether the aging can be generated from the ERP system, can they break their projects into in progress, suspended, etc. And then based on that, uh, they can really change their ERP system to ensure that maximum amount of information can be generated through system. Otherwise, it could be too much of a manual exercise, which will take time. And also, we need to, uh, as a company, we need to implement proper processes and controls in terms of the quality of the aging that is being generated, accuracy of that aging, as well as completeness of the aging that is being generated. So these are some of the changes which a company would need to make in order to ensure that uh, the information disclosed is a part, as a part of the schedule is complete and accurate. Moving on to uh, next slide. Yeah, so this is a second basket of disclosure. So on the first, on the previous slide, we saw we need to give aging on a combined basis for two categories, which is progress, project in progress, and projects which are temporarily suspended. Here, the requirement is that if your projects are overdue, both in terms of time, and in or in terms of cost so let us say my budget was 100 crores and as at 31st march 2022 i have incurred 150 crores of the cost in that project which means my project is there's a cost overrun in my project those projects where there's a cost overrun or there's a time overrun are required to be disclosed as a part of this schedule to say that when those overdue projects will get completed Will it, will it get completed less than one year? Will it take maybe more than two years or even more than three years? So that information for by each major project will need to be disclosed as a part of the schedule so that the users of the financial statements, more particularly the lenders who would have funded those projects become aware that fine, for such projects, there's a delay either on account of time or on account of uh, cost. And this is the time frame which management is estimating to complete those projects uh, uh, in the coming financial year. So this is again a very voluminous information which company would need to actually compile and then disclose that information in the schedule three. Now, uh, let us understand what do we mean by the word project because the disclosure here requires to be made by project. So project one, project two, project three would name the project and then you will accordingly list down the value, the CVIP value of those projects, whether there's a time overrun or the cost overrun, and then when those projects will get completed. So that is the disclosure that is required. So when it comes to project, project means a group of assets which are capable of intended use or a common intended use. Uh, to give an example, uh, let us say uh, you have a power plant, right? Now, a power plant has a common intended use to generate power for the, for the project. Uh, a power plant can have multiple individual assets like boiler will be there as a part of the power plant. There'll be turbine, there'll be generators, there'll be control panels, there'll be electrical fittings, etc. So there are individual components of those assets uh, of the power plant. But when we define the project for all practical purposes, since my boiler, turbine or generator individually cannot achieve the intended use, my project will be defined as the power plant. And on that basis, I will track my cost over and I will track my time over and right. So in this example, power plant will become my project and then I'll have to accordingly decide, is there a, is there a over and in that power project? When you actually decide to disclose information as a part of this disclosure, what you need to see is is there an actual time or a cost overrun and not an anticipated time or a cost overrun? Okay. So for example, my, my original plan or my budget for a power plant was, let us say 200 crores. Uh, as at 31st March, 2022, I have incurred about 100 crores of the cost. Based on my information, I believe that I will still need 150 crores more to complete the project, which means that while my budget was 200 crores, I'm going to incur about 250 crores of cost, which will result in an overrun of 50 crores. But since as at 31st March, 2022, 
my actual cost incurred, which is 100 crores, is lower than my budget. There is no overrun as that 31st March 2022, which is actual overrun. And hence, those projects will not get covered as a part of this disclosure. So to put it differently, if my actual CVIP value for a power plant would have been 250 crores as at 31st March 2022, those will get disclosed. If those are below my project cost, my budgeted cost, those items will not get disclosed as a part of the schedule. So we need to be mindful in terms of what information we disclose here, and those will only be actual overruns that need to be disclosed. Uh, again, as I said, uh, this is a substantial uh, in case of large companies which are which are in the expansion mode, uh, having sizable projects which are happening maybe throughout India at multiple locations. Compilation of this information could be could be a challenge, uh, and hence it is important that uh, those information. Uh, I mean, this requirement is being kind of socialized with your project team, capital project team within the organization, so that the required information is being properly maintained, and then those can be utilized for the purpose of reporting under this uh, under this clause. While, uh, as I said, the information requirement is voluminous. But what is important is this will provide the various stakeholders like investors, lenders, who are actually invested in some of these projects of valuable information uh, on the status and the operational effectiveness of the project uh, that is happening uh, within the organization. I will move on to uh, next slide. This is also a disclosure which is relating to fixed assets. Uh, so this is not new in a sense because previously as a part of our CARO 2016, uh, auditors were required to comment whether title deeds of immovable property were held in the name of the company or otherwise. And if those or if those title deeds were not in the name of the company, then auditors were disclosing those information in the CARO report. Now, with this change, management in their financial statements are also required to disclose the details of Im immovable properties where title leads are not held in the name of the company uh, uh, and uh, and there are specific format which has been prescribed for the disclosure of additional information that is required to be disclosed so uh, what has changed between caro 16 versus this disclosure there are two three things which has undergone a change first is maybe previously the understanding in the previous caro was generally that the title deeds of human property were more relating to fixed assets as opposed to any other categories of immobile property like investment property or you know assets which are held for sale or maybe bearer plants or etc right so those were not previously covered now the schedule 3 and caro both specify that information about investment property non-current assets held for sale etc are also required to be reported if the title deeds are not in the name of the company second they have also asked information about leased properties. So if there's an immobile property like buildings where companies are lessee and the lease deeds are not in the name of the company, even those information are required to be disclosed as a part of this schedule and also uh, in CARO 2020. So that is also required to be covered. And third, specifically under this format, if those properties are being held by promoter directors employees of promoters or directors or relatives of promoters and directors then those need to be specifically mentioned here along with the other details like when the property was acquired what is the value of the property what is the reason why the property was not transferred in the name of the company and if there's a dispute then that information is also required to be disclosed as a part of uh, schedule 3 so again uh, 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 as I said, while there's no significant, I would say it, this requirement was always there, but uh, there are additional columns which need to be included. That is one. And secondly, the scope has been changed compared to previous uh, reporting. Uh, here, what is important is uh, typically this challenge of title deeds not being in the name of the company would arise in situations where, let us say, there's a recent amalgamation or merger, takeovers, acquisitions, right? There, it will take some time for companies to really get those title deeds in your name, or there could be a dispute uh, because of which the title deeds are not held in the name of the company. So we need to be mindful of such transactions which has happened in the company, and then ensure that 
those assets which are being acquired are actually getting transferred in the name of the company or if those are not transferred then the required information will need to be disclosed as a part of the schedule i also mentioned that this reporting requirement is consistent with schedule 3 and caro 2020 so it is very important that what gets disclosed in the financial statements also gets kind of correspondingly reported in the audit report so there should be a consistency of information between the two uh, financial information both in caro report as well as as well as the financial statements i'll move to the next slide <clears throat> so this is a fourth item which deals with property plant and equipment and intangible assets so here while the requirement is not that substantive i would say so this is applicable in case of companies who have revalued their property plant and equipment or intangible asset if the company has done so the expectation is that they need to disclose whether the revaluation was performed by a valuer who is registered under the company's act okay if the person or the valuer is not registered under the company's act then the fact that he, the person or the valuer is not registered need to be disclosed in the financial statements uh, secondly uh, under ndas 40 which typic which deals with investment property um, for the purpose of disclosure companies are required to get the fair valuation of those properties done even in those cases uh, it is important to assess that the valuer who is engaged uh, for the purpose of getting this valuation done is a registered valuer under the company's app so basically all the valuations which are being done by the company relating to investment property property planted equipment or intangible assets those are expected to be done by a registered valuer if those are not done then the fact about the same needs to be disclosed in the financial statements so uh, here the purpose is more to bring consistency that uh, and maybe drive the focus that whatever valuation company uh, tries to get in uh, those are actually through a registered valuer and if those are not done then those information will need to be disclosed as a part of the financial statements so if i look at the property planning equipment intangible asset investment property there were four major changes first one was showing the aging of civic second one was providing disclosures about time and cost over and third one was about title deeds not being held in the name of the company and fourth was applicable when there's a revaluation of property planning equipment and or intangible assets so those are four amendments which are applicable for these categories of assets moving on to the next basket which is trade receivables here also there has been a significant increase in the requirement so now the expectation is that companies would need to provide a detailed aging of the trade receivable balances in the following format so they have specifically mentioned the age bucket for which the aging needs to be provided so it is less than six months six to months to one year and so forth so this is the format that need to be applied for the purpose of disclosure that is one secondly the requirement is also to break down the disclosure into two components one what are the undisputed trade receivables and second what are the disputed trade receivables and within each of those there are subcategories like consider a good uh, cases where there's a significant increase in the credit risk and third is case where there's an increase in the uh, so third is where the receivable is credit impaired so you need to divide the total receivables into these six baskets in some cases all baskets may not be applicable so you can uh, there will be no information which will be reported and then disclose the aging of those trade receivables in this specific format <coughs> this aging is required to be computed from the due date when the receivables become due for payment so normally you will have invoice date and then you will have a credit period and then they'll have a due date so based on the due date the information would need to be disclosed and compiled in the financial statements uh, it is important also that if your systems and erps are configured in a way to compute aging based on the invoice date then those may have to undergo a change because 
the disclosure requirement is more from due date of payment that is one uh, second is it need to be a contractually driven due date so both parties were contractually agreed to a due date that need to be considered if let us say there are no evidences to support or there are no fixed due date which is being agreed with the party then the date of the transaction will need to be taken as the date from which you will compute the aging of this or trade receivables uh, this schedule also requires a separate disclosure in case of unbilled use so in normal situation um, unbilled use may not get may not in some companies like for example media companies unbilled use since those are not billed those will not be part of trade receivable balance and will be separately shown in the financial statements so in those cases the aging or sorry i mean the total amount of those unbilled dues uh, uh, will need to be disclosed as a part of uh, as a part of the disclosure in the schedule 3 so apart from aging we also need to disclose the details of unbilled dues in the financial statements uh, here what is important is how do you really engage with your marketing function legal function to decide what are your customers where there is a dispute right dispute means a customer may disagree with the amount payable uh, on account of maybe quality differences rate differences price differences or discount differences right so if there is a disagreement on the amount which is being payable to the company then those will be treated as dis uh, disputed dues and balance would be undisputed so effectively company will need to engage closely with their marketing function and the legal function to really identify customers where there's a dispute and then report those items uh, in this in this schedule uh, secondly uh, what is important is when when uh, the dispute is being identified uh, we need to also assess whether it will have a bearing on the risk assessment of those receivables and accordingly do we really need to actually make higher provision if if we believe that uh the amount recoverable may not get recovered uh from the party so that is that is one important item that need to be bear in mind uh there could be a situation where um there is no dispute uh, with the customer but customer is not capable to make payment there be all this could be on account of bankruptcy this could be on account of many credit defaults etc such situation would not be treated as uh, would not be treated as disputed however there would be a corresponding provision on account of credit impaired or significant increase in credit risk a uh, second practical challenge could also come where i have a receivable from a party and there's a uh, and there's a payable with that party now i have a dispute on the payable leg right uh, and because of which the customer is not able to pay that amount to the company in such situation while there's a dispute on the payable side of the transaction uh, but since there is no dispute on the receivable side the receivable will continue to be shown as undisputed trade receivable uh, will come to trade payable side where those amounts will be disclosed as uh, as disputed but so long as trade receivables is concerned this will be undisputed because customer has not disputed the, uh, the receivable it is just the payable which is disputed because of which company has retained this much amount which is to be uh, not paid to the company uh here i think if if company have certain processes of obtaining periodic confirmation from their customers about uh, about balances which are due they can include as a part of the confirmation a positive statement to say that none of these balances are disputed this will be a positive evidence maybe from auditor's point of view and also from the management point of view to classify information based on those confirmation that are being obtained from the counterparties and then disclose the information on that basis so this was as i said a substantive change uh, so far as receivables are concerned uh, uh, and then company would need to really update their erp systems processes and controls to ensure that uh, those information are being properly compiled and reported coming to trade payable site so a similar information is required to be disclosed for trade payables here also we have two baskets uh, one is disputed and undisputed and within undisputed and disputed there are sub categories like amount payable to msme 
an amount payable to other than MSME, and then you have a, 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 a format of disclosure which is prescribed, whereby you would actually disclose the amounts as per the aging, uh, which is due for payment. So same similar requirements which are there for trade receivables are also applicable for trade payable. A few points to be bear in mind is typically for receipt for payables you would have those accruals, right? For example, freight payables. Uh, there could be a situation where you have received the material but invoice is not received, or you have accounted for certain accruals for expenses for certain services. So those unbilled dues are also required to be reported as a part of this trade payable aging. Um, uh, so if those are not due, you can insert a column to say that uh, these are unbilled dues towards vendors so that your total may reconcile with the financial statements. Um, and if you and if you know those informations are available about um, uh, disputed and disputed, those are also required to be disclosed as a part of the schedule. So one, we need to discuss accruals as a part of unbilled trade payable on the schedule, provide aging based on the due date of the, due date of the payment, and identify which are the parties where we dis we have disputed the amount payable, and hence those are separately to be classified as uh, disputed trade payable and uh, break that into two components which is disputed as well as undisputed so these are the requirements which are there for trade payable more or less similar considerations uh, which we discuss for trade receivables will apply here uh, and company need to disclose this information as a part of uh, schedule three i will move to the next slide uh, yeah so this information is about loans and advances to promoters, directors, and KMP. Companies who have granted loans or advances in the nature of loans to promoters, directors, KMPs, or related parties, and if those loans are repayable on demand, or there are no specific terms which are being specified as per the contract. Okay, so there's there's no there's no information about repayment terms or when this loan will be repaid or if the terms are such that it is repayable on demand those are the categories of transactions which will get covered as a part of this disclosure so here what is important is you have given a loan or advances in the nature of loan and the amount as at the balance sheet date is outstanding and if those conditions are met then you need to disclose the amount of loans and advances which are outstanding in each of the categories like promoter, director, KMP, and related parties. And accordingly, also disclose the percentage of the total loans and advances vis-a-vis uh, -vis these loans which are being given to promoter, director, and KMP. So total amount of outstanding and the percentage that needs to be disclosed. So this is an important information that needs to be kind of complied with. Uh, here, what is important is we need to see this relationship between promoters, directors, and KMP on the date of transaction. So if on the date of transaction when the loan was given, a uh, company had a relationship as with the counterparty as director or a related party, then it will get covered and the amount should be outstanding as at the balance sheet date. So if there's any change subsequently in the relationship, it will not impact the disclosure which is there in the financial statements. Now, let us understand what do we mean by the term advances in the nature of loan. Uh, typically, we all understand what is loan, but advances in the nature of loan are something where the characteristic on the documentation or as per the terms is shown as advance. But if you look at it, it may sound like or it may appear like a loan. So to give an example, let us say you have given an amount calling it out as an advance to a director, uh, which is, let us say, for one year period, um, or to a party, which is, which is, a, which is a related party uh, for purchase of material, uh, whereby, you know, you would normally you purchase, let us say, one crore of material from that party, but you have given, let us say, 100 crores of advance to that party, and under a purchase order. While the terms of the contract are such that you have given advance for purchase of material, but if you look at the substance of the transaction, you will normally make a purchase of 10 crores from a party, but you have given an advance of 100 
scrolls, which is far in excess of the purchase value, those will be treated as advanced in the nature of loan. Or to, and maybe an, another example would be that the processing period for that material that we are going to buy from a vendor is let us say three months, but you have given them in advance of let us say two years. So there's a disproportion in terms of the period for which the advance should have been given as per the normal trade practice but you have given it advance for a much longer period so those will be a situation where uh, advance while it is being called as an advance as a part of the purchase order or documentation but would actually be a loan and hence those will need to be accordingly disclosed in the financial statements uh, as a part of this disclosure a uh, similar requirement also exists under caro 2020 so we need to ensure consistency between this information as well as information which is reported in caro uh, we also need to be mindful how this information is reflected in the financial statements as a part of related party disclosure so uh, ensure consistency between what we report here vis-a-vis -vis what we report in related party schedule and also while computing the limits under section 186 these loans or even the advances in the nature of loan would need to be considered for the purpose of ensuring that the amount of loan or investment security or guarantee do not exceed the limits which are prescribed under section 186 of the Companies Act. So this is an disclosure requirement about, uh, about loans and advances in the nature of loan uh, which need to be included in the financial statements. Now, this is a very substantive requirement and maybe we'll understand in detail uh, about more about this requirement. Now, of late you have been hearing instances of financial fraud on account of maybe round tripping, evergreening, siphoning of funds, creating a complex structure so that funds move from one entity to any other, another, and then, you know, you are not able to actually find a trail or how the funds are being monitored, I mean, moving and where it is being utilized. So in order to arrest such complex funding structures, this is a new disclosure requirement which has been introduced. And I'll brief, I will just slowly take you through this requirement. So it says that where a company has advanced or loaned or invested funds to any other person, which would typically be an intermediaries with an understanding that such intermediary party will directly or indirectly make further loan or investment to any other third party which will be nothing but an ultimate beneficiary of these funds or such intermediary provides guarantee security or any other benefit for or on behalf of the ultimate beneficiary then such transactions which are primarily used to conceal the identity identity of the ultimate beneficiary will need to be disclosed in the financial statements and we need to disclose the all the required details which are there on the slide so company will need to disclose amount and date when the company has given the loan to the intermediary party along with the complete detail like name of the intermediary what are their identification number like sin number or pan number etc as well as the relationship between the company and that intermediary party okay Second information that needs to be disclosed is what are the amount and the date when the intermediary party in turn made a further advances or further loan or further investment to an ultimate beneficiary, right? So those information also need to be captured in case of the company who has given loan to an intermediary party. Third, there has to be specific mention in the financial statements that all the required provisions of PEMA as well as money law prevention of money laundering act has been complied with in respect of these transactions okay so it's a quite a detailed requirement and uh, would would you know for companies they need to be mindful that they don't enter into a structure where funds are moving from one entity to another and then in turn move to third uh, third party and if those are happening those details will need to be disclosed. Uh, in order to mirror this requirement in the financial statements, there's a, as I said, there's an update to the auditor's report, 
whereby auditors are also required to comment in their auditors report the main audit report to say that company has adequately disclosed the information in the financial statements and there are no other transaction other than those disclosed in the financial statements where a company has entered into such complex structures uh, of either being giving loans or investments to intermediaries which in turn are being given to ultimate beneficiary so the the substantive requirement and i think the objective is to identify such transactions that's one and uh, to get it reported in the financial statements here uh, there is no exemption of uh, of reporting these transactions if such transactions take place between a holding company and a subsidiary company so for example if a holding company makes an investment in an intermediate company and the intermediate company makes a loan to a subsidiary which is downstream subsidiary such transactions are also required to be reported and disclosed as a part of uh, this disclosure uh as an auditor i think we would need to actually bear in mind and be cautious and have uh, have uh, you know view about maybe reviewing the minutes of the meeting director's resolution shareholder agreements investment agreement etc to see is there a pattern or is there a way by which these amounts are being given to intermediaries and in turn are getting in kind of you know utilized to a Uh, ultimate beneficiary company so uh, uh, this is a very i would say detailed requirement and then we need to be cautious about how we really perform adequate procedures to be comfortable with this requirement both from auditor's point of view and also from the management point of view to ensure that the required information is disclosed in the financial statements moving on to next one so this requirement has two components first one was where the reporting company makes advances loans or investment then they need to disclose this information there's one more requirement which is in section b which talks about that i as a reporting company if i have received some funds from an investment or a funding company with an instructions or with an understanding that i will pass on these funds to a ultimate beneficiary either through loans through investments through guarantees or through securities then the reporting entity who is receiving the money and in turn making the payment to a ultimate beneficiary would also need to disclose the details like from whom i have received the money the name of that company the details of the transaction whom this money is being paid out uh, which is intermediate company and the relevant details that the transactions are in compliance with fema as well as prevention of money laundering act so section a deals with where i give the money and section b deals with where i have received the money as an intermediary and i need to actually invest the money to a ultimate beneficiary so again as i said similar considerations would apply and it also may require that as an auditor i may need to obtain the financial statements of the company where i have made the investment the reported reporting company has made the investment or has made loans whether the intermediary company or whether that company to whom investment has been made or loans has been given are they using that amount for the purpose of their own business operations or are those being utilized for the purpose of granting further loans investments or guarantees to a third party so uh, a combination of information like confirmation from uh, the loanee party review of minutes of the meetings review of loan agreements review of the financial statements of those intermediary parties if those are available would be some of the procedures which we as as an auditor would need to be performed to be comfortable with the disclosure in the financial statements which are being made by the company uh, as a part of the schedule 3 <coughs> uh, moving on to the next requirement which is a uh, requirement related to borrowing obtained on the basis of security of current assets so this requirement will be applicable in situations where a reporting entity obtains borrowing on security of current asset okay and as a part of the their agreement they normally are expected to file a periodic returns in terms of their uh, working capital in terms of their inventory positions in terms of their receivable positions uh to the bankers so that bankers can actually assess uh the liquidity position of the company 
so in such cases we i mean company would need to reconcile the information that is being shared by the company to those bankers and ensure that those actually agrees with the financial statements or books and records right and if those are not done or if there's a difference between what i submitted to the bankers vis a vis what is there in the books of accounts the details of those differences and the reasons of the differences would need to be actually reported in the financial statements so that people are aware of those material differences and also the reasons why there were such material differences this is a similar reporting requirement in caro so auditors would also need to report that if there were differences what were the reasons of those differences and how uh, we are comfortable uh, uh, that the correct information has been submitted to the bankers at a appropriate time certain specific nuances related to this so if this if a company has obtained a borrowing on the basis of security of non current assets like property planted equipment or maybe any other asset which are not current asset then this disclosure is not applicable so uh, those would not be covered through as a part of this that is one aspect second is there could be a situation that company has obtained the borrowing on the basis of current assets of other companies which are group companies or related entities if that is the case even then while company's own current assets are not secured or not given as a security uh, but security is given by way of and current assets of another entities even those cases will be covered as a part of this disclosure requirement and company would need to actually provide information uh, that okay there were differences or there were no differences between the information that is being reported vis a vis uh, those which are filed by the group companies second is we need to look at the sanction borrowing so for example there could be a situation where i have taken a credit limit from a bank but maybe as a, i have just taken the credit limit and then we are at the year end uh, of march and the amount of those filings is coming free to ensure that those reconcile with the books of accounts uh there could be situation that companies as a part of their agreement with the bankers may submit the information on a monthly basis okay um uh, and then uh, so they will have submitted maybe 12 months of information uh, which will be which will be there as per the books of accounts but we as an auditor and also management as a part of the dis disclosure in the financial statements are only required to cover quarterly statements and returns so we just need to compare quarterly information with books of accounts and if there are any differences then those information are to be reported as a part of as a part of the financial statements another important point is it is not necessary that you have the borrowing which is outstanding as of the balance sheet date if let us say a borrowing was taken during the year and was repaid in full before the year end so there is no outstanding borrowing but since company had taken loan during the year and was making those filings of quarterly returns and statements then uh, a reconciliation would need to be performed between books of accounts and those quarterly statements moving on to next one so this is a requirement about willful defaulter this will be applicable when a reporting entity is being declared as a willful defaulter by banks financial institutions and lenders uh, as per the regulations which are prescribed by rbi so if a reporting entity is being declared as willful defaulter then details like when the part when the reporting entity was declared as a willful defaulter and what is the amount and the nature of default needs to be disclosed in the financial statements now typically willful defaulter will be declared by banks and finances institutions from whom the reporting entity has actually borrowed money and there has been default in either making in making the repayment of principal or interest uh, there is a definition of willful defaulter as per rbi guidelines and it covers several instances like where the default is being made in repayment of principal and interest uh, while company is capable of honoring its commitment or a default is being made by the reporting company and the funds which were obtained 
by the reporting entity has not been applied for the purposes for which it is being obtained or has been siphoned off or has been applied for a different purpose uh, than for which it was obtained etc so these are some of the examples of willful defaulter so if company has been declared as a willful defaulter then the required information uh, is required to be disclosed in the financial statements here uh, we need to take the uh, the period which is even from the balance sheet date till the date of the approval of accounts uh, also so for example if company was not declared as willful defaulter as at 31st march 2022 but maybe in june because of certain reasons company was declared as a willful defaulter and it was before the approval of financial statements then such information will also need to be captured as a part of the financial statements uh, uh, as a part of this disclosure next one is about uh, is applicable in situations where there's a non-compliance with regard to number of layers of companies okay so uh, typically a company is not required to have more than two layers of subsidiaries so if the holding company is company a and they have maybe three layers b c d uh, which are subsidies of this holding company since the um, there are certain exemptions of course but since these three companies are a subsidiary of a holding company then since those are more than two and not in compliance with the requirement of the companies act then uh, details about which are the companies which are beyond the specified layer in this case it will be company c and also what is the relationship between the holding company and the downstream company and the percentage of the holding needs to be disclosed in the financial statement so this will typically be applicable where you have a complex structures uh, multiple uh, you know subsidies which are there those do not fit into the exemption about wholly owned subsidies or maybe uh, you know foreign subsidies etc and if there's a non-compliance then the details about the non-compliance need to be disclosed in the financial statements so there's no change so far as compliance or the law is concerned but if there is a non-compliance then of course this needs to be covered in the financial statements and also as an auditor we would need to bear in mind the reporting implications of this non-compliance uh, on the audit opinion so uh, that is the limited change that is there, that is there as a part of this schedule 3 moving on to next one uh, this is again a very voluminous information that is required to be disclosed as a part of schedule 3 so if a reporting company is having any transactions with the companies which are struck off from the registrar of companies um, during the year then and if there are transactions in the nature of maybe investments receivables payables or any other transactions right then those information along with the details which are there on the table like name of the company nature of transactions balance outstanding and the relationship with that stock of company needs to be disclosed here the challenge is that we have about multiple register of companies because each company each state will have their own roc they would periodically actually update and notify companies whose names are being struck off right so if i'm a large company with operations in multiple states i have my customers my vendors in different spread out jurisdictions uh, it may be challenging for the company to really have a compile the information about what are those reporting what are those companies which are struck off and do i have a business transactions with such companies which are being struck off uh, uh, by the roc so this may require effort in terms of compiling the information and reporting the information as a part of schedule 3. Uh, I have seen in case of large companies, they do engage a, a professional firm who actually have the compilation of those stock of companies for each of the jurisdiction, each of the states. And then the details about customer masters, vendor masters are being shared. Of course, under the non-confidentiality agreement, non-disclosure I mean, agreement. So what they do is they would relook up or they would kind of compare those stock of companies list with companies vendor masters customer masters or maybe investments and then see are there any companies where there were transactions 
uh, where and they were stuck off and if those are the cases then a report is being submitted to the reporting entity to say that fine out of maybe 30 customers five are something where you have receivables with a stock of company and those are required to be reported or disclosed as a part of the financial statement so maybe company can in-house manage if their operations are small but if it is a large group with more than various operations in different states come this reporting could be a little tedious and time taking and hence it is important that we start early uh, and compile the required information which is required to be disclosed as a part of uh, uh, this this schedule there could be a situation that you have a, a foreign subsidiary and a foreign subsidiary may have transactions with customers and vendors in india so they would also need to actually go through the process of identifying those companies where the names could have been struck off and those will also be need to be reported as a part of uh, as a part of the schedule 3 if uh, they are required to comply with schedule 3 for the purpose of consolidation uh, of those financial statements in India. so important point both from domestic company point of view as well as from overseas company point of view to ensure that the information is being compiled properly uh, another important point is once you have identified a transaction and the balances which are outstanding with the stock of company you really need to assess uh, a provisioning of those receivable and payable balances receivable balances investment balances or any other assets which are there with that complete and ensure that those are being appropriately reflected in the financial statements moving on to next one uh, this is again a small requirement uh, just to drive home the point that it is very important for companies to register the charges with roc as per the time frame um, so if if there's a delay in in kind of you know filing making a required filing with roc about any charges or satisfaction which is pending then the details of such delays along with the reasons needs to be disclosed in the financial statement so uh, the purpose is to drive timely compliance and then if there's a delay the same needs to be disclosed in the financial statements Uh, this is again an important change which has come and uh, for some of the listed companies even CB has included the requirement to include ratios as a part of the CB results it kind of it was there started with September quarter September 2021 and then it will be there uh, for uh, March 22 as well so some of the ratios which I have highlighted in bold are common in in CB as well as in companies act uh, schedule 3 and there are other additional ratios which are there in schedule 3 uh, uh, which are need to be disclosed in the financial statements. Uh, here, the requirement is that one, you need to actually define what are the numerator and the denominator you would use for each of these ratios. Current ratio, it could be current asset versus current liability. So you need to disclose that. Secondly, if there's a change in any of these ratios, which is more than 25% compared to corresponding period. So in this case, when we prepare for March 22, and if there's, let us say there's a change in debt equity ratio by more than 25% uh, between 21 to 22, then of course, company need to provide reasons and explanations of those changes, which are more than 25%. Uh, so one is, of course, you explain the items, you explain the reason why there's a change, uh, for each of these ratios in the financial statements of course this is a this is a important change because in a way this will help provide various stakeholders with you know different ratios analysis uh, and they can really uh, you know identify uh, and uh, have insights about the operations of the company how how quickly the company is able to turn over their receivables how quickly they are able to effectively manage their inventory what is the return on capital employed what is the return on investments etc so it will be a useful information to the users and to the stakeholders it will provide insights uh, about the operation of the company and then uh, you know people can actually relate uh, and maybe benchmark of, of companies which are in the same industry how they are performing vis-a-vis -vis the reporting entity there where you have made investments uh, here a few points to uh, consider is companies more particularly listed companies has always been making certain disclosures about their ratios as a part of mdna so it is important that there is a consistency between 
the information which is being used for the purpose of computing these ratios vis-a-vis -vis what is being disclosed in the MDNA so that there are no disparities. There is one. You also need to ensure consistency of these ratios to the extent those are common with CBE results. With um, as I said, if there are tax audits, there are certain ratios in tax audit like net profit ratio, etc. So those need to be consistent uh, and kind of you know uh, evaluated. Uh, the formulas for each of these ratios are kind of defined in a nature B to the guidance now. Of course, uh, those are generalized formulas. And if let us say there are specific nuances about a particular industry, a particular company, then company can really make changes to those ratios to identify those outliers or to kind of you know indicate any specific uh, change as a part of their industry. But they need to really explain for each of these ratios what has been the numerator, what has been the denominator. So that users are able to actually compare that okay maybe company a has taken this but company b has actually not taken uh, certain items which are supposed to be taken or which is very peculiar to this particular company so that is uh, these are sort of some of the things which we need to bear in mind while while preparing for this information uh, again this information needs to be compiled for both current year as well as previous year and um, we need to have a proper control mechanism to ensure that those are being properly reviewed so that there are no outliers, there are no unusual variations which are there while computing these ratios uh, and disclosing the financial statements. Some other ratios, as I said, include current ratio, and there are about 10 to 12 ratios, and those are need to be included in the financial statements. Moving on to the next item, which is Benami property. So this is a requirement which is also there in Caro, uh, uh, which is also there in Caro 2020. So this is applicable when, as a reporting entity, there has been any proceedings which have been initiated or pending against the company for holding any Benami property under the Benami Transactions Prohibition Act. Okay. Now let us understand what is Benami property. Benami property would typically be in a property where a property is being held or transferred in favor of one person, but the consideration for that property is being paid by another person. Okay. And the property is being held for the benefit of the person who is making the or who is paying the consideration. So if a property is in the name of party A, but payment is being made by party B, and the property is being held by for the benefit of party B, then it is a, actually a Benami property. And the person in whose name the property is registered is a Benami holder. Okay, so if, if there are any such proceedings against the company where there are allegations that a company is a Benami the holder, or maybe there are any other uh, proceedings, then those details about the nature of the property, the value of the property, uh, who are the beneficiaries, uh, who are the what is the relationship between the company and the beneficiary and the status of uh, those proceedings as well as what is the company's position on those uh, matters would need to be disclosed in the financial statement so this again is expected to be uh, not applicable to all categories of companies but as an auditor we need to be mindful to go through the litigation logs to go through maybe uh, news against you know in case of the reporting company to identify have there any been any proceedings which are being initiated against the company? And if so, whether required disclosures are being made in the financial statements for, uh, for such details. Uh, it is also important that if there are such transactions which are being substantiated and the conclusion is such that company is a Benami holder, then we need to, as an auditor, look at the wider repercussions about processes and controls, is there an override? Is there a fraud which is being taken place? And what are the reporting implications? Because there could be a situation that an asset has been recognized in the financial statements, but company is not a true owner of that asset. And hence, maybe there could be a misstatement in the financial statements that need to be corrected. So as an auditor, we need to look at the repercussion of this. And from a company point of view, if there are such proceedings, then of course, the details need to be disclosed in the financial statements along with the company's position 
as well as the status of the proceedings. Moving on to next item, which is uh, which is CSR. Um, so here, I would say previously also Schedule Three required certain disclosures to be made in the financial statements. Of course, now there are certain additional disclosures which have been brought about, uh, like uh, what has been the previous year shortfall, the nature of the CSR activities, uh, etc. So while the while the requirement has always been there but of course the requirement has increased now in the in the revised schedule 3 so there are there is about uh, six to seven items where the disclosures are required to be made uh, in the financial statements this the purpose is actually to increase the enhance or to increase the requirement is to drive focus about uh, you know about the CS csr activities along with the nature if there's any a shortfall what has been the reason for the shortfall how much has been the shortfall how companies are actually planning to deploy those shortfall in the coming year etc right so those are the requirements which company need to comply with this is in addition to the existing requirement which comes from technical guide on corporate social responsibility about and also about from the companies act about disclosing what are the unspent amount relating to ongoing projects where companies required to actually deposit the funds into a separate bank account what are the csr activities where which where it relates to other than ongoing projects and where companies are actually required to make a transfer to a notified fund as per the companies as per the section 135 of the act so those are the additional requirements which need to be complied with along with these uh these requirements which are there in schedule 3 about required amount which is required to be spent what is the shortfall reasons for the shortfall nature of the csr activity will be more from schedule 8 which prescribes the details of each of the csr activities which can be taken if company has a trust where it is it is using as a vehicle to actually implement some of the csr activities then of course the details of those needs to be disclosed along with any provisions which are being made um, for any contractual obligations relating to csr activities so these are some of the information which needs to be disclosed on the financial statements under csr moving on to next one uh, which is on undisclosed income so here uh, this is applicable when a company a reporting company had certain transactions which were previously not recorded in the books of accounts but subsequently as a part of the tax assessments company has surrendered those transactions as undisclosed income and has offered those transactions to tax okay uh, if that is a situation in case of the reporting entity then the details about the same needs to be disclosed in the financial statements along with the fact that whether such previously unrecorded income or the asset has been properly now accounted for in the books of accounts okay so this will be again um, applicable in case where a company has surrendered such income and declared as non as undisclosed income as a part of a tax assessment if they have done so then the details like description of the transaction which assessment year such transactions lead to amount which are being kind of filed and declared in the return of income and financial year for which the transaction is uh, recorded will be required to be disclosed in the financial statements uh, certain important considerations to be borne in mind is there could be a situation that if there is a survey or a search operation in the in case of reporting company and as a part of those operations maybe due to coercion or due to any other reason the directors would have made certain statements as declaring those items as undisclosed income but subsequently they retracted from those statements okay so in such case while initially the statements would have been made as undisclosed income but so long as the company is disputing those those would not be covered as a part of the disclosure okay that is one Secondly, as a part of the tax assessment, if let us say an income tax officer has kind of as a part of its order has mentioned that company has certain undisclosed income, though company is disputing such undisclosed income and they have not voluntarily surrendered or offered such income as a part of the income tax assessment, even those items will not be covered and disclosed as a part of this uh, disclosure requirement. Okay, so where the company disputes such additions 
uh, such uh, 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 disclosures made in the during the search and seizure operations those are not covered only those transactions which are being voluntarily offered by the company as undisclosed income will need to be reported as a part of this disclosure requirement Here, yeah, what is important is now, uh, if let us say company has surrendered such amounts as the undisclosed income, then we as an auditor would need to bear in mind, of course, that will it require a reinstatement of the financial statements? Because it could be a multi misstatement of certain assets income not being recorded in the respective year but recorded in the current financial year or maybe subsequent financial year so we need to assess that as an auditor second we need to also see was there an element of fraud of course there would be an element of fraud and what are the reporting responsibilities 14312 so internal financial controls for those so these are some of the important considerations that we need to bear in mind if at all company has surrendered or disclosed those items as a part of the tax assessment and those are disclosed in the financial statement so it is very important that we have all these elements properly thought out and then evaluated as a part of uh, both from management side to restate the financial statements and also from the auditor side to evaluate the impact on internal controls financial statements audit opinion uh, and other uh, reporting under companies act So with that, I think we have covered substantially all the major amendments. I will just take you through briefly some of the amendments which are which are there in Schedule 3, but are not expected to be widely applicable to most of the companies. So the first one is compliance with approved schemes of arrangement. So typically what would happen is if there's a scheme of arrangement which is being approved by the competent authority under the Companies Act, companies would need to disclose whether the effect of such scheme are being appropriately recorded in the books of accounts A as per the scheme and B as per the accounting standards. Okay. If there is a deviation of treatment of such transactions in the books of accounts, either if those are not in accordance with the scheme or if those are not in accordance with the accounting standard, then those deviations are need to be disclosed in the financial statement as a part of this uh, disclosure. Uh, let us say a, a company complies with the scheme, but those are in not with accounting standard, then the company we need to disclose that company has given effect to the scheme as per the accounting treatment mentioned in the scheme and those are not in account those are not in line with the accounting standard and these are the impacts uh, uh, which could happen if company were to give an effect of this uh, transaction as per the requirement of the accounting standards those disclosures are required to be made in the financial statements this is equally applicable on the schemes which are here, but also all which were being earlier those in the financial if they just the likeness of the company. Of course, everybody is not virtual currency, RBI, finance ministry. They are kind of really creating a regulatory framework uh, and at least a tax framework on uh, on these cryptocurrencies. And hence, with this growing focus uh, in India and also in globally, and the amount of transactions that are being executed using this cryptocurrency. Uh, schedule 3 now requires an information that if the company has traded in cryptocurrency or has made an investment in the cryptocurrency or virtual currency then certain details like amount of currency held amount of gain and loss uh, that it has earned on account of its trading or investment in the cryptocurrency or if you have received any money from any person for the purposes of trading or investing in the cryptocurrency or virtual currency then those details are required to be disclosed in the financial statements and then of course we need to ensure uh, one
once the regulators once the regulatory framework is in place are those in compliance with the with the regulation as well so this is again a disclosure which may not be applicable to all companies but it is there looking at the growing focus on the cryptocurrency uh, which is evolving lastly um, There's a requirement to mention that if the company has not utilized its borrowing from banks of any balance sheet, they then coming to be in clause of spread to I think whether as long as it is not being it is financial statement. For this clause, the fund financial statements we are able the funds which are being borrowed is first, then of course have been obtained. Then of course the details are to be mentioned in the in the financial statements, and of course auditor would need to then uh, bear in mind what are what could be the potential re, uh, reporting implication of those non compliance uh, of the terms with the lender uh, if the funds are not being utilized for the purposes for which it is being obtained so uh, uh, with that i think uh, we have come to an end of uh, this presentation and, and uh, i'm happy to take any uh, questions you may have uh, on this A scheduled three disclosures. Hello, can you hear me? Anyone? Hello. Hello. Yeah, hi, Shang. I thought maybe was was the connection there was a problem in my connection or? Uh... Uh, at the end, in five minutes, it was some breakable. Hello. Yeah. In fact, it's uh, your voice is somewhat breaking, sir okay okay so do you uh, do you want me to repeat uh, maybe a section on other amendments or i'm not sure which yeah. uh, so we have time right now if you can then please you can uh, okay. so which part should i cover should i cover other amendments or uh, i'm not sure which part people could other do properly and other then amendments. i can just take it again if it's possible take other amendments hello Hello, can you hear me? Subhashji? Hello, Subhashji? Is there any technical person over here? Hello?
हाँ हेलो हाँ मेरी आवाज आ रही है मिश्रा जी हाँ मैम आपकी आवाज क्लियर है ओके सो वो काइंडली चेक क्यों फैकल्टी का प्रॉब्लम आ रहा है वहाँ पे उनका नेटवर्क डाउन हो गया मैम लेट्स सी दो मिनट में नहीं तो उनको कांटेक्ट कीजिए उनको मैं फोन करने का फोन करता हूँ मैं यस यस फोन करिए हम्म हम्म भाई मैडम उनको फोन कर रहा हूँ पापा से ज्वाइन करेंगे ओके आई थिंक वो ज्वाइन कर रहे हैं हाँ ज्वाइन कर रहे हैं सर आपका माइक कनेक्ट करिए सर हेलो प्रवीण सर हेलो प्रवीण सर कैन यू हेयर मी हाँ हाँ सर सर ऑडियो आ रहा है अभी आपका सर सर आपका नेटवर्क डाउन हो गया हेलो अभी आ आ रहा है आपका आवाज सर 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 अभी आपका आवाज आ रहा है सर, आपका पूरा नेटवर्क डाउन हो गया था सर अभी से डाउन हो गया था मतलब थ्रू आउट सर ट्वेंटी टू ट्वेंटी थ्री स्लाइड से डाउन हुआ था सर अच्छा तो आई कैन स्टार्ट फ्रॉम ट्वेंटी टू इफ यू आर ओके आई कैन Should I cover? Should I start with twenty one? Two seconds. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sir. You can go on. Hello. You yes, can. Sir. Yes, 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 So I'll just start with slide number twenty, which talks about um, talk of companies. Okay, and I'll just quickly take you through that. Yeah. So, um, so this is, as I said, this is a requirement which is applicable in case of companies where they have have transactions which with with the companies which are stuck off. Okay, whose name has been stuck off by ROC. And if there are any customers vendors or you have made investments to any of the companies then of course uh, the details about name of the company the transactions which you have executed the balance outstanding needs to be disclosed as a part of schedule 3 okay um, this could be quite voluminous because uh, you have different states and there are different i mean each of the roc in the respective state can actually uh prescribe those names on a periodic basis and it becomes difficult sometimes to keep track of the name of the company which has stuck off and hence uh to compile this information could be voluminous um i know some of the large companies which have operations in various states and jurisdictions actually take support of a professional firm who kind of have the information about um those companies which has stuck off and then um they can actually share the masters about customers vendors under a non disclosure agreement to say that which will help them to identify that um which can help them to identify which are the companies which whose name have been stuck off and if the company has those balances with those companies then of course those will need to be disclosed as a part of this schedule 3 um uh what is important is actually you need to bear in mind that once you have identified those parties whose name have been stuck off and you have a receivable or investment balances with those companies then uh, uh, we need to assess the proper provisioning requirement as a part of uh, to evaluate whether those amounts are recoverable or not okay uh, so again a very voluminous information requirement that need to be uh, complied with and actually uh, uh, i would recommend that you know people can start early so that those informations are being properly complied 
properly compile compiled and then disclosed as a part of schedule 3 uh, this can also be challenging for companies who are uh, who are having subsidies or operations outside india and they may have uh, customers vendors who are in india so they would also need to be actually evaluate um, that are they having any transactions with such companies we just struck off and uh, accordingly disclose this information in the financial statement because for the purpose of consolidation uh, you know uh, the, the subsidy company would also need to have this information uh, for the purpose of preparation of consumer financial statements so uh, uh, we need to start early on this and uh, compile the required information uh, moving on to next one this is again a small requirement that you know to drive a timely filing of satisfaction of charges so if it is there's a delay of uh, any charges uh, which are not registered with ROC and there's a delay in terms of making those charges registered or satisfaction registered then the details about those charges needs to be disclosed in the financial statements along with the reason why there's a delay okay so the purpose is actually to drive home um, or tracking timely completion of uh, filing of uh, creation as well as satisfaction of charges with the registrar of companies moving on to the next one this is again a disclosure for ratios so uh, financial statements have pres i mean schedule 3 has prescribed certain ratios to be disclosed there are about 11 ratios to be disclosed in the financial statements um, this is in a way consistent with what cb has done as a part of the lodr uh, from september 2020 onwards as a part of the cb results they are required to disclose certain ratios uh, in the cb results and if you look at the item which are highlighted in bold are someone something which is common in in cb regulation as well so uh, these are common and there are other ratios in addition which are required to be given in schedule 3 uh, so company what need to they need to do is they need to actually in, uh, explain each and every item which is included in the numerator in the denominator uh, and also if there's a variation of the ratio between current period as well as corresponding period then of course uh, uh, more than 25 percent uh, if the if the variation is more than 25 percent then those need to be disclosed in the financial statements um, the definition of each of these ratios are given in annexure b to the guidance note people can refer to that and then actually use it for the purpose of determining the numerator and the denominator but what is important is uh, there could be industry specific nuances company specific nuances which can be then tailored uh, uh, on those formulas to ensure that those make sense and those reflect the operations of the company this is again a very important and a uh, important disclosure requirement which will provide insights to the stakeholders about the operations of the company how how quickly they are able to turn over their inventory how quickly they are able to realize their receivables what has been the return on capital employed etc uh, which is very important uh, some listed companies do disclose these ratios as a part of their manage uh, mdna so companies need to ensure consistency of these ratios vis-a-vis -vis mdna what they disclose in the cb results to ensure that there's a harmony of the information that is being disclosed in the various forums and various publications uh, moving on to the next one this is uh, benami property disclosure so this is applicable in case where any proceedings have been initiated or pending against the company under the benami transactions act and if there is such proceedings which are being initiated then the details about the nature of the property the year of acquisition the amount involved the details of the beneficiary and the relationship etc are need to be disclosed in the financial statements uh, generally um, benami property would be something where property is being held in the name of one com one person but the consideration is being paid by another person and the property is being held for the benefit of uh, the person who is paying the consideration so uh, if that is the case then it becomes a benami property and if the reporting company is having any proceedings under the benami transactions law then those details are required to be disclosed in the schedule 3 uh, we as an auditor would also need to be mindful uh, are those indicative of uh, any fraudulent transactions or are there any implications which are reporting implications uh, under the companies act if at all there are such proceedings which are being identified uh, we can look at the litigation logs we can look at you know discussion with the management tax assessments etc to identify are there any, any such matters or properties which are not in the which are held uh, and which are prohibited uh, under the Benami transaction side? Next one is CSR. So this is again not a significant change. Uh, these were required to be disclosed previously. There are certain additional information which are required to be disclosed now, like nature of CSR activities, 
uh, reasons for the shortfall, etc. So, in a way, this drives the focus of the regulator on the CSR activities, and they would need to know more if at all there is a shortfall, and how the company is planning to deal with those shortfall, both for the current year as well as the carried forward shortfall of the previous year. This is in addition to the disclosure requirement under Schedule under Section 135 of the Companies Act, which deals with uh, if you have an ongoing project and you have unspent amount, what is the value of that? If there is an other than ongoing project where you have an amount which is unspent, what is the value of that? And then whether those are being transferred to a separate bank account or to a notified fund as per the requirement of the Companies Act under Section 135. Lastly, I mean, uh, undisclosed income. So this is applicable only in case where, um, where say there were certain income or transactions which are previously not recorded by the reporting company, but subsequently as a part of the tax assessment, company voluntarily declares those income as undisclosed income and then pays tax on those undisclosed income. Those information are required to be disclosed in the financial statements. If there are such such um, income which is being surrendered, then of course, uh, company need to disclose the description of the transaction, the value involved, what is the status of that matter, um, and then which financial year this relates to, etc. And also the fact that whether those previously unrecorded recorded income has now been recognized in the in the financial statements. Here, what is important is if at all there's an addition made by the tax officer in the in the tax assessment, but company has disputed those additions, or if there's a search and seizure operations where certain directors have made certain uh, you know made a statement as undisclosed income under coercion or force and then later on retracted from that information those will not be covered as a part of this disclosure because this is only applicable in situations where company voluntarily makes a disclosure of undisclosed income in the tax assessment and have actually offered the same in the tax returns uh, from an audit point of view we need to be mindful of such transactions to and assess the impact of such undisclosed income from um, internal controls point of view, from reporting implications point of view, and also whether it will require a restatement of the financial statements because it is a material amount which was supposed to be recorded in the earlier years, but is not being disclosed or recorded in the previous financial year. So this is a reporting on undisclosed income. There are certain other amendments which I'll quickly take you through. Uh, so the first one is on the compliance with approved schemes and arrangements. So uh, this will be disclosed in cases where company has a scheme of arrangement which is being approved by the competent authority and company need to disclose that the effect of such scheme are being properly accounted for in the books of accounts a in accordance with the requirement of the scheme and b in accordance with the requirement of the relevant accounting standard in case if there's a deviation on recording this transaction either from the scheme point of view or from accounting standard point of view then the deviation needs to be disclosed in the financial statements. If there are no deviations, so there's no disclosure that is required, the company can make a positive statement to say that company has given effect to the scheme in the books of accounts, in accordance with the accounting standard, as well as in accordance with the, uh, the scheme document which is being approved by the competent authority. Important point to note is, this is not only applicable to the schemes which are being approved in the current financial year or in the previous financial year, but also, something where the schemes were approved in earlier uh, years but continue to have an impact in the financial statements for current year as well as for the previous year next is around the cryptocurrency so uh, con considering the growing focus of crypto and virtual currency there has been a disclosure requirement around cryptocurrency to say that if there are any profits on such transactions company need to disclose it the amount of currency that are there uh, uh, they need to disclose and if at all you have received any advances or deposits for the purpose of trading into cryptocurrency or virtual currency then of course those are also required to be disclosed in the financial statements lastly utilization of borrowing so where a company has not used the borrowing in accordance with the terms and conditions of the sanction then company need to disclose the details that about such borrowings and where they have been actually used Okay, this is only applicable where the funds are not being used for the purposes for which it is being raised by the company from banks and financial institutions. Uh, here, important point is there is no need to have a one-on-one -on -one nexus between raising the borrowing and deployment of the funds. So long as on an overall basis, there's a sufficient mapping of funds to say that company has actually used those money for the purposes for which it is being obtained, then uh, there's no need to 
stay that you know company has not used the funds for the purpose for which it is obtained the funds this is little different from caro because caro typically covers uh, term loan here it will be applicable for all categories of borrowing whether it is current borrowing or non current borrowing so uh, those are required to be disclosed in the financial statements so with that i think uh, i have come to the end of the presentation and maybe hello we can yeah, yeah. hello yeah thank you so much sir and we have few questions over here if you don't mind we can continue with the questions yeah yeah yeah, yeah of course uh, so there is a question from oscar polaco what if the promoters have sold all their all their shares as on 31st march 2021 so how do we record that yeah so the disclosure about promoter holding is at the reporting date basically what we need to do is let us say a promoter had a holding of maybe 25% at the beginning of the year and during the year they have sold those shares so there will be an information which will be disclosed in the corresponding year that okay this were the details of promoter and these were the percentage and then we also need to disclose the percentage change so in this case in your example if the entire holding of the promoter has been sold off during the current year then the percentage change will be 100% we will disclose the holding for the corresponding period and there will be zero disclosure or not zero billing you will disclose nil amount for the current financial year to say that the promoter has actually sold off their entire holding in the current financial year Okay. Uh, next question is from Komal Khedkar. What can be errors in share capital? Uh, will you please give an example for this? Yeah. So uh, typically, it could happen that um, you know uh, under NDS, uh, you could have certain items like compound financial instruments, right? Whereby a portion could be debt, a portion could be equity, uh, and let us say company has not properly assess those. Um, those instrument and have recorded the entire value as equity share capital uh, which otherwise would have been recorded at a lower value in such cases probably a uh, company would need to then disclose uh, those errors in the uh, in the share capital if there are those errors in the share capital so it could it will generally be very rare but it could arise on the account of complex financial instruments uh, which were otherwise required to be classified as compound financial instruments but company didn't kind of apply those guidances and those are disclosed as equity share capital of the company okay or there could be a situation where there could be a situation where uh, an in, instrument which is appearing to be in form as debt instrument but when you look at the terms it is more of an equity right so uh, those can also be a situation where a, a company has recorded it as a debt but if you apply a india's requirement those could be classified as equity so those are some of the examples where there could be a misstatement of equity capital okay uh, next question is what does disputed trade receivables considered good means yeah so uh, what would happen is um, when you assess considered good situation you would see do you see a possibility that the amount will be recoverable and there is no chance that uh, there could be a provision which will be required or there's an increase in the credit risk uh, right now while factually there could be a situation that you have a you have a case where a dispute is there with the party it could be on account of value or it could be on account of rate or it could be on account of certain other terms in terms of timing of delivery okay so if it is a timing of delivery and you believe that while the dispute is there but it does not really reflect uh on the uh on the increase in the credit risk or which may result into a situation of credit impaired debtors then those those will be classified as considered good uh but shown as a disputed category uh, on the contrary if you believe that maybe 20 percent of the receivable may not be recovered okay so then you would disclose maybe 80 percent as disputed considered good and maybe 20 percent will be somewhere where you believe that there would be a significant increase in the credit risk for that portion and hence those will be classified accordingly okay next question is so it is a good question because uh, sorry so it is a good question because you would always have a nexus between if it is disputed normally they may not be considered good but 
it will all be need to be evaluated on the facts of the case and you may have a situation where while it is disputed but it is still considered good uh, in the financial statements sorry yeah yeah uh, next question is for amendment for revaluation in case where ppa has hmm. been under business combinations will the disclosure be attracted no so uh, what happens is when you do a business combination and when you acquire certain assets, you acquire and record those assets on the fair value on day one. Okay. Now, once you have recorded those assets at fair value on day one, based on the valuation that is being performed, then you decide how do you want to measure it subsequently. So company may have a choice to measure it based on the historical cost model or can measure it based on the revaluation model. So that would be a subsequent measurement. So you may have a situation where you acquired an asset under the business combination, you have done a fair value, but that fair value become, will become a cost basis for that asset. And subsequently, if you decide to measure that asset on cost, then there's no need of revaluation being performed. If you decide to measure those assets on the fair value or a revaluation, then of course, you would need to undergo a revaluation requirement. Uh, you need to perform revaluation and the disclosure would need to be made in the financial statement. So, this is only required where company follows a revaluation model of subsequent measurement of the fixed assets. Okay. Uh, next question is regarding revaluation only. What if the revaluation is done in earlier years and not in the financial year? So even then we need to disclose regarding the evaluate revaluation. Yeah, so a uh, good question. So typically these disclosures that we have discussed today are applicable for March 22 and the corresponding period of March 21. So if a revaluation is being done for March 21, and since you are disclosing the corresponding period information, you would need to disclose the revaluation amount for the corresponding period. However, if you say the revaluation was done in, let us say 2019, for example, then of course, those will not be covered under Schedule 3. Uh, next question. Generally, yeah. you would consist. Sorry, but generally, yes, if yes. you follow a revaluation model, then you would need to consistently follow the revaluation model on a periodic basis. So, uh, generally, you would you will perform the revaluation of those assets unless uh, it has been either sold off or you have changed your accounting policy from revaluation model to cost model. Okay. Yeah. Should I go? Sorry. to Yes. 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 Uh, for disclosure of land of loan to related parties, what if a person mm -hmm. is covered in more than one category? That is, one person may be director as well as KMP. Then, uh, how do we disclose it? Yeah, I think it is a good question. Um, uh, and this will be the case where, so for example, if a person is, so uh, you know, you there's a definition of KMP in the company act to say that KMP would be those people who are managing director, whole time director, CA4, company secretary. Okay, these are a specific definition of KMP. So if, if, an, if an director is just a director, a non-executive director who is not an MD, CA4, managing director, then it will be disclosed under the director section. If the director is also a whole time director or a managing director, then it will be disclosed as a part of KMP. So those need to be evaluated on a case to case basis. Okay. Uh, next question is in case of utilization of borrowed funds if company loan to other entity during the year or prior year for different date that is in a year minimum 20 to 30 times then how can we disclose the same mm, this is uh, this question is for which one actually there's a there's a question is this about that intermediary and funding party or this is about the last one which is utilization of borrowed fund i'm not so i will maybe answer in both the scenario um, so if you have a borrowing and let us say you the purpose was to use it for working capital but you have actually not deployed the funds for working capital but have given a loan to your subsidiaries then the amount that need to be disclosed is the amount of borrowing so you may have taken a borrowing of 100 crores those are given a loan in the multiple times with your uh, to your subsidiaries but 
ultimately the utilization of 100 crores is not as per the requirement of the term loan or as per the term sheet okay so the disclosure will be to the extent of 100 crores that is for the borrowing part uh, if i look at it from the point of view of intermediary and the funding party then the disclosure for all the transactions if it happens on a multiple time then you need to then provide the details of those each of the transactions in the financial statements if there is a, the same party you can state the name of the party the maximum amount and then you can say maybe it has been given on the multiple occasions and the dates of those transactions as well in the financial statements okay i'm not sure if uh, I'm not, yeah, I sh I'm sure if I'm able to answer your question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the next question From which financial year amendment in Schedule 3 will be applicable? Whether it's applicable for the financial year 21 22? And the second question is whether CARO 20 reporting is applicable for the audit report for the financial year 21 22 or not? Yeah, I think this has been, we discussed this in my initial slide. So schedule three is applicable from period beginning on or after 1-4-2021. So effectively, the first time schedule three is applicable is for FY21-22, okay? But as a part of the requirement, we also need to represent the corresponding period. So for all the disclosures which are there, those will need to be presented for the corresponding period. So to answer the question, Schedule 3 is applicable from FY21-22. Uh, similarly, CARO is also applicable from uh, FY21-22. So both these requirements are applicable from FY21-22. Uh, if the company is following a December year as a calendar year, as a, as a financial year for the purpose of preparation of the financial statements, then for them, the first year for which the Schedule 3 will be applicable will be December 22, uh, because it will be from period on or after 1 for 2021. Uh, next question is, is it applicable for uh, Section 8 companies as well? Yeah, Schedule 3 is applicable for Section 8 companies as well, yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is, I need clarification on the prior period adjustment relating to equity share capital amendment. What type of amendment is it? From Mithul Doshi. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think we, we just briefly touched upon this. So this amendment is more to do with if there is, our, if there is any error in the equity share capital relating to um, in the financial statements. Uh, and you have decided to restate your equity share capital on account of those to correct those errors, then you need to disclose what was the share capital at the beginning of the year, what is the impact of the error, third is what is the restated value, and fourth is what is the closing balance. So you need to disclose the details of the impact of uh, those restatement of the equity share capital in the financial statements. Mm -hmm. I'll just, uh, I will just go to that, uh, yeah. Yeah, go move forward, so no problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, next is, section is very important. So if you can do so, it's great. From Harshil Patil. Which section okay. you're saying, sorry? Uh, it's not written, it's not clearly written over there. Okay. Loan section, I think. Loan section is very important. Okay. So, uh, is there a question have... around it? or? Uh, uh, no, I think we can move forward. Hmm. He was asking from this slide, presentation slide. Okay. 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 The next, next question is, in case of CWIP, if there is a change in scope, then there then will it be considered as a new project or do we include it in project delay and cost overrun? Yeah, I think this is a good question. So typically what would happen is for the purposes of reporting time and cost overrun, you would take into account your original project. Okay. Now, if let us say there's a change in the scope, for example, you have decided previously to have one power plant. Now you decide to change the scope to have a two power plant. 
then this change in the scope will be a separate i would say estimate or a separate budget and you need to track your actual expenditures against this separate scope separately right so you would not combine the two you would treat each of the two as a separate basket and then evaluate whether there is any time overrun in the original plan and the increased plan which is separate you need to set track it separately so you would not treat that as an overrun if there's an if, if there's a change in the scope uh, you need to actually track those separately we have been ending up with the questions and can you please share the presentation yeah of course i will do that yeah, almost all questions are covered yeah so i'm uh, i'm so sorry i think maybe sometime uh, at slide 20 i didn't realize that you know the connection was not there uh, and maybe uh, some of the people in the audience may not able to hear me but uh, i tried to cover but if at all uh, there are any questions of course you can reach out to me and i can respond to those as well yeah thank you thank you so much sir and yeah uh, hello everyone and good evening to all uh, who are present over here in in quite a good number till the end of the session so and it's my great pleasure to uh, on behalf of wrc of ici to propose a vote of thanks to our today's uh, session speaker uh, ca pravin setia sir uh, thanks for coming over here and uh, giving your time and your contribution towards our our session topic Uh, which was on amendment to schedule 3 division 2 to indes and uh, it was really insightful and uh, quite nice session sir uh, from your side uh, you have taken each and every point in very detail and also explained with some various examples also so i think it must be uh, benefited to all the members also who are present here so thank you thank you so much and uh, i would also thank to ca rudesh uh, pankhania rcm and to palak uh, for joining today in this session and thank you one and all thank you so much thank you thank you everyone take care bye bye sir bye bye thank you thank you